Hello everyone at CompAge. This talk is going to be about combining magnetic resonance imaging and magnetoencephalography for enhanced biomarker learning. <clears throat> First of all, a quick perspective. Um, clinical neuroscience has vastly benefited from machine learning over the past 10 years. Nevertheless, we are facing important epistemological and practical challenges. First and foremost, um, often the generative mechanism is unknown, um, as nicely exemplified by the study um, conducted by Jones and Cording, concluded that um, if microprocessors would be studied with contemporary neuroscience methods, we would not be able to infer the inner workings and mechanisms of these processors. Um, then you may resort to machine learning in thinking that the predictive signal in itself is informative. And anyways, we have big data, right? And nevertheless, um, with colleagues, we have demonstrated um, using massive simulations that um, machine learning at the current um, stage cannot guarantee for inferences and causal inferences regarding the predictors. Um, so then you will say, okay, we still have the predictive signal, the accuracy in itself, which is interesting, right? Um, nevertheless, um, there is also some reason for um, yeah, being careful because it's, uh, yeah, it's been noted several times over the past years that um, as larger data sets are used, Often the predictive accuracy seems to be lower, pointing at problems with overfitting or heterogeneity in the data generating mechanisms. So a common phenomenon is that uh, you see studies with perfect uh, or more than 90% accuracy cross-validation. And um, as, as, as the published studies tend to be larger, um, the, the, the performance estimate is less, optimal, less, less optimistic. So what do we do with this? We have high dimensional inputs. Um, in the clinical setting and we want to combine them into a meaningful prediction of a clinical endpoint. Um, but we have all these problems. Are we doomed? Um, I would say not. Um, just we have to be careful and to make sure that we use some good prior knowledge, um, yeah, which is an important safeguard when, when, when operating in this high-dimensional regime with few observations that is so characteristic of contemporary clinical neuroscience. Okay. And um, this perspective directly motivates today's topic, which is about building surrogate biomarkers. Let's assume, for example, that we have the following problem. There are only a few labeled data, um, or um, it is expensive to come by these labels. For example, we want to look at cognitive decline. And in order to get a measurement of the cognitive decline, we need neuropsychologists, we need medical doctors, we need equipment, and we need to pay for all of this. And um, at the end, we may have a data set with 100 or 200 patients and 200 controls, which may not qualify for high fidelity machine learning. So what do we do? Um, well, one idea is that we instead learn to predict a widely available label, for example, age of a person, and then exploit its intrinsic correlation with our actual outcome of interest. Um, such that um, we can then use this prediction as a surrogate biomarker. And uh, this idea has been put forward in the last 10, 10 years and most visibly by the, by the idea of the brain age, um, where the idea is that when predicting age from neuroimaging data, such as MRI images, the residual, that is the difference between the predicted age and the actual age, cont contains important information regarding accelerated or precocious uh, aging. Um, for example, in this graphic that I took from the James Cohen Molecular Psychiatry paper, um, the idea is that if the brain age delta is positive, the predicted age is actually larger than the actual age, and this may point at some neurodegenerative um, um, problem. And indeed, in the past years, uh, we have found, not, not we personally as, <laughs> as authors, but uh, the community has found, that um, indeed the brain age delta captures important clinical information and has been associated with lots of bad things, for example, like uh, um, yeah, um, predicting mortality, predicting morbidity, predicting cognitive decline. And um, one can say fairly that, one, one can say for sure that um, the measure has been um, validated and uh, has captures clinical notions. And um, importantly, so far, this effort has concentrated on fMRI or particularly MRI and anatomical MRI as input modalities. Um, yes, this is good, but uh, as someone who's coming from MEG and EEG research, I'm of course interested in uh, what electrophysiology can add to the story. 
And first of all, shall we bother about MEG or EEG? Um, in the past decade, we have also seen lots of research investigating the correspondence between um, MEG source localized signals and fMRI, for example. And um, there has been seminal work, the seminal work by uh, Matthew Brooks and colleagues who show that um, one can also extract major large-scale networks from ongoing MEG activity that looks like an fMRI, for example, sensory motor networks or um, default mode network and what have you. And um, there has been lots of interesting research going on on the correspondence, on the identity uh, of, of MEG, on the capacity of MEG and EEG to capture the same as fMRI. However, there has been recently a new trend, a new shift that um, de-emphasized the search for correspondence and instead emphasized the search for divergences, for complementarity. Um, I picked here the study by Denis Kumbral and colleagues from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, who show that um, essentially um, there is very little um, correspondence between, um, or if there is correspondence between source localized power maps and fMRI ongoing activity, there are also many things that are different. The spatial maps don't look the same, connectivity structure doesn't look the same, and there's other studies out there that have found converging evidence. For example, the recent study by Max Nantwich and colleagues from New York. Okay, and this is for me a very positive message because it allows us potentially to search for complementary information and add MEG and EEG to this tool stack. So what features would we use when building a machine learning model with MEG and EEG? And um, I'm a great fan of power spectra because they are directly visible with simple tools. We can visualize them simply. Here, for example, in the CAMCAN dataset that we investigated in the study, um, we can plot the power spectrum by age group, which is done here. Lighter colors or brighter colors present subjects that are older. Um, and we can see a couple of things by visual inspection already, by looking at a double logarithmic plot that shows the frequency on the x-axis and the power on the y-axis. For example, we see that there is a difference in the power, and this has also been reported in other studies working on EEG and trying to link in the cross-subject prediction setting um, alpha power to cognitive function. Um, other studies have focused on the alpha peak, and indeed we can see here that in older people the peak seems to be lower. On the other hand, there is fine-grained spatial information in the MEG and EEG signals that can be captured when um, looking at the topographies. And it seems to be that there are also um, subtle modulations of, um, of the power that depend on the location, on the sensor array. And other authors like the Wytek, Wytek and and colleagues have emphasized the importance of the non-oscillatory component of the signal, like 1 over f fits. And there are many other things to look at, like, for example, um, the latency of um, visual or auditory um, evoked responses. The question is, how can we enhance this? Um, and one important uh, aspect that comes back to this motive of um, using prior knowledge um, <coughs> is related to analysis in the source space. Why is that? Well, this is the setting. We are having electromagnetic recordings or electroencephalographic recordings. In this case, we focused on MEG recordings, um, not EEG in the CAMCAN, but it could have been EEG as well. And um, the goal is to approximate a target, like age in this case, from the inputs, which is the signals. Now, um, one brute force way would be to just ignore any prior knowledge, but for that we would need lots of data. And since we are in a medium-sized data regime with a few hundreds of subjects, um, we need to use prior knowledge. And um, as neuroscientists, we can say something about what generated these signals. And indeed, there is a brain that is underlying our observations. So um, there are um, yeah, layer four. Um, in the layer four of the cortex, we find uh, pyramidal neurons which synchronize their activity, and if more than 40,000 neurons synchronize their activity, measurable MEG signals emerge on the sensor array. The problem is, however, that we cannot see the brain directly. We just know this from other observations, from other studies, and we have to assume that there is a, that there is a generator. Um, so how can we build a statistical model of this? First of all, um, we assume that there is a latent um, set 
of components that could describe brain regions or um, networks that share the same statistical fate. And we can resolve as many components as we have sensors in principle. We cannot resolve statistically more components than we have sensor that we, that we use for the measurement. And then it is very convenient in terms of statistical modeling to use a sort of an ICA, independent component analysis generative model, where we assume that um, a mixing process is going on because we have electromagnetic field spread. So many sources are projecting on many sensors. And as a result, the sources are mixed on the sensors, which can be typically well done with, with ICA. So you have this X equals A by S. And this is all fine. However, since we are performing regression modeling, we have to take also care about the generative model that uh, dominates the observations of our outcome. And let's assume um, that we do linear combinations of um, the sources um, to approximate the outcome. And um, this is where it becomes interesting. Assuming, for example, that um, I have to move my finger, um, there will be um, concrete motor neurons in my motor cortex that synchronize their activity and really produce my finger movement. And um, maybe what is really important for this is the power. Then what happens is that um, if you look into this uh, um, notation number two here, is that um, we have first, um, um, yeah, we have first the power, and then we have the linear combination, which when we walk back the, the, the signal generating path in formula one on the left hand side, produces a nonlinear transform. So if you want to do a linear model that gets as inputs the x. Um, to approximate why, while the data has been generated under a nonlinear model, our model applied to the sensor space cannot capture these sources. Okay, and um, this is the topic actually of a second presentation. If you're interested in this, there is a poster by my PhD student David Sabak, um, comp page ID fourteen. So this means that um, yeah, we need we need source localization or we need other tricks to to deal with this uh, uh, nonlinearity if you want to use linear models. Okay, um, so we are using source localization, we are using power spectra, and uh, now the question is how we put the results together with MRI and fMRI. While fMRI and MRI have been widely studied in brain age, um, for MEG this is not so clear, and um, as we have multiple modalities, um, the stacking method is very interesting, because the stacking method allows us to build a nonlinear model um, combining it with a linear model. So if this is unclear, let's have a, let's have a look at things. The idea is that um, since all the different inputs um, are high in dimensionality, it is a good idea to use a linear model, which is biased and stiff and uh, will overfit less and has less uh, expected uh, generalization error. Um, and then use the predictions from the linear models from each input modality to build a derived data set with only few dimensions. So for example, one prediction for MEG, one prediction for fMRI, one prediction for MRI, and then send this into a random forest model that can correct for the bias of the linear model and uh, enhance and augment the linear model in terms of expressiveness, but also um, enables, for example, um, tricks for missing value coding, which is important in this paper. Um, there is also an overview if you're interested in the details. There is table one and table two in the paper um, where all the features are listed. And for the fMRI and the MRI part, we relied on um, previous work by my colleagues Franz Liem and Gael Varocco, um, who also introduced the stacking method in the context of the brain age. Okay, so um, the question is then, um, can we enhance brain age prediction by combining MEG, MEG, MRI and fMRI. What we did here is that we first presented a baseline, which is prediction of brain age using anatomy only. This is the blue box plot here. And um, so what I do here is a difference. So the blue box plot obviously on average is, uh, is yeah, the, the difference between, the, we use MRI as a baseline. So um, the MRI measure is centered around zero. And then we can see that on average, when combining MRI with MEG, the prediction is enhanced by almost one year on average, and the same for fMRI. And now when we combine everything in the black box below, the prediction gets significantly better, more than one year on average, with very clear effects, also rank stability if you look into the supplements. Um, yes. Um, but um, 
yes, okay, well, you will say, okay, great, we enhanced the brain age delta, but does it have any practical consequence? To address this question, we looked at the correlation after partializing out residuals with age to have specific effects um, between the brain age delta and uh, neuropsychological scores that were available in the CamCam dataset. And what we see here is that um, same color code as before. Um, as we go from the left to the right and we build increasingly complex models, the cross-validated brain age delta shows um, enhanced associations with neuropsychological scores and what stands out in in particular is fluid intelligence and um, yeah, cognitive decline as, as measured with a mini mental state exam or sleep quality and, and things like that. And sometimes new associations emerge, but very often also the effect size is improved. So there was more correlation all of a sudden with, with fluid intelligence. Then, um, yeah, um, what does this mean? Why, what is the contribution explained by? And uh, we can say by inspecting the variable importance metric of the random forest from the, from the stacking layer number two, um, that essentially the, the, the source power has the strongest impact on the MEG contributed prediction. If you look at this with a model comparison approach, you can see the light blue box is just um, these sort of anecdotal sensor space features. And out of a sudden, when you do source connectivity or source activity, you have the strongest change in the prediction performance. And um, by combining everything, there is not much um, advantage added. Um, so, well, is it then worth in practice actually the effort to collect all these modalities? And one important message that we have in this paper is that um, in principle, it is always a good idea to combine all the different inputs because the missing value coding actually allows you to opportunistically combine different modalities and we show in simulation uh, analysis here or in yeah, reanalysis of the data after um, doing missing value coding or just reducing the data set to the common cases that uh, you never have any disadvantage of training the model on missing values. Yeah, and it can be easily handled in, in the context of this architecture. So, um, what have we learned so far? First of all, the stacking method is convenient for combining high-dimensional inputs on medium-sized datasets. This means also that if you have maybe 10,000 cases or 20,000 cases, you could just send everything into a random forest. But as we operate on 600 or 500 samples, um, this is a convenient trick to fight or yeah, to, 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 to decide the, the curse of dimension levity in our favor. Second, the MEG contains unique information on cognitive aging, not only with regard to brain age prediction in terms of accuracy, but also with regard to um, out of sample associations with neuropsychological scoring. And these effects are best explained by the source power um, measured with MEG. Finally, the tree-based methods that we use in layer two bring flexible tricks and options for handling missing values. And we show that in, in practice, uh, you are not um, necessarily, um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a good idea to restrict the data to um, yeah, the common cases, but it's a good idea actually to take whatever you have in terms of uh, multimodal inputs. Um, to conclude, I just want to highlight um, that um, yeah, this, this work also benefited from an important ecosystem, um, namely the MNE software, uh, to which I have been a, a long-standing contributor for, for many years. Um, there is, of course, um, the, the MNE uh, software itself with its open source community and more than 100 contributors and yearly workshops. Uh, um, but there are, of course, um, also um, specific tools that um, enable scalable large-scale processing of MEG and EG data that we have contributed over the years, like the auto-reject project or um, tools for um, automated shrinkage and uh, stable estimation of covariances, but also support for accessing large-scale data sets and interfacing with R, which is an important tool for data visualization and statistical analysis. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm happy to take questions. And before getting into the questions, I want to thank all my co-authors um, for this work um, and also our lab and the MNE community and uh, yeah, everyone who supported this project. Thank you very much.